Hi, Key. Hey, hello. How are you guys? Good. We're great. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome back to our Phase Zero podcast. Thank you for joining us and talking full spoilers for uh, season one of Loki. Congratulations on an epic show. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's it's just been so nice now that I don't have to keep all the secrets. <laughs> so it's like like a massive like, oh, thank God, thank God. <laughs> so, do, they, do they give you like a list when you first start of like, here's all the things you really can't say like in week one and then in week two and so on. Is that how that works? It's more like, I suppose like the things for us were like, I think we kind of knew, right? Because we knew that obviously about the timekeepers, we knew who they were going to meet in ep six. So I think it was more just like, don't ruin those big surprises and <laughs> like any twist in the show, of which there are many basically. So yeah, but it's definitely been like, ah, oh, <laughs> like trying to not ruin stuff. So yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I can only imagine. So um, I know you were a huge Marvel fan before this. Um, when you watched Avengers Endgame, did you have any idea that when Loki took the Tesseract and disappeared that you would be directing what comes next? No, no, I had no idea. I think I, I, I remember I had the same questions as everyone else, right? I was just like, where did he go? What's going to happen? He's alive. <laughs> like, yeah, so I, no, I, I didn't. I mean, it was really weird. I remember that I think when I pitched on it, I'm trying to remember, like, I can't, I feel like I went to go see Spider-Man, but I, yeah, but I think that was like the nearest Marvel thing to around the time when I was pitching. But even then I didn't know I had the job because it was quite a long process, obviously. So yeah, no, I had no idea, but I was so excited though. when I found out murmurings, obviously that he was getting his own show. So yeah. <laughs> That's like that Tom Holland experience of watching the Avengers and then being in the Avengers. It's like the, everybody, it's so cool to be a fan and join the family. <laughs> so I know like with actors, sometimes they don't know who they're even playing when they get when they audition and stuff like that. So when you were approached for Loki or when you approached Marvel for Loki, like when you had your pitch, did you kind of deter, like in that pitch, did you decide the end point? Did they have an end point in mind? Did you guys kind of meet on something? Like how does that work to start with? Yeah, sure. So when I pitched, basically, I got Michael's pilot script, uh, Alyssa's script for episode two. I don't think Fisher's script was done yet for episode three. I think I got that once I had the job maybe, but yeah, but they, I don't know, I did get it. So I got, I think I got the first three scripts and then I got outlines for like the second half of the show. And I think like the rough kind of shape of it was definitely there. Like, you know, we knew that he was going to meet Sylvie, they were going to fall in love and they would be, you know, I think we weren't quite sure how they would get to the void. <laughs> I think it was always known that Loki would somehow end up there and that Elioth would be there. And we didn't know exactly that, for example, things, these are little details, but like the portal will be inside Elioth. Like we just knew somehow they would defeat Elioth and that would lead them to he who remains. Um, but that, so kind of that rough spine was in there in the sense of that. I think there were little details like the Minutemen, for example, I think there was discussion about should they be robotic or clones or like, how does the TVA work? Who are the workers? So like the conspiracy behind the TVA um, then we'll be in variants is something we spoke about once I joined and had the job. Um, tonal things across the show. Um, yeah, but I'd say like the kind of broad strokes of it were definitely in place. So Marvel were like, you know, we want to set up the TVA. Loki's going to meet another version of himself and it's going to be this female version who's this cool, like original character, like based on the comics. Um, yeah, and that they will go meet He Who Remains at the end. So I knew when I was, so it's my long-winded way of saying, <laughs> I knew when I was pitching that we were, obviously taking Loki on a really new journey, but also the finale would be launching, you know, the next, well, a variant of the next big bad. So yeah, so I was like, oh, <laughs> like, yeah. So there was quite a lot, there's quite a lot, but it's exciting, obviously seeing that already, so. And then you mentioned the comics. Um, there are so many different references across season one to different Loki comics, like Agents of Asgard and Boat Loki and Daniel Kimblesmith's run. How much comic homaging did you want to do? I know on social media, you've spoken about it a little bit. Yeah, I think for me, like, I just, I love so many of the stories with him in the comics and like particularly episode five, it was so rich, right? Because I, you know, I was like, oh, this is where we can get to have lots of fun. Like, I think because originally we knew that a group of bandit Lokis were going to go to the palace, but we didn't necessarily know who the leader was going to be. And I remember even with Tom, like, I think at one point, this is more scheduled, but I remember because obviously he's like in every scene. <laughs> and so we were like, okay, well, maybe he could play like one of the bandits because I think I love the idea in episode two that you know you see all these Lokis that look like him to kind of throw you off the scent of Sylvie but I was like oh but we never see a Loki that looks like him who is Tom and it'd be really fun if he could play another version of himself and then when we 
were thinking about the bandits, I was like, oh, it'd be cool to have president in there. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like the leader. And then it was just, you know, everyone was like, oh, well, it has to be Tom. Like, it'd be so fun. And yeah, I think he had a bit of like a, I'm trying to remember what we filmed that day, but I remember you guys would have to ask him, but because I can't remember, honestly, but I remember he was playing like our Loki and it was quite emotionally taxing, I think, what we were filming. And then he had to go be president. And I think he was like, who am I? What's going on? Like, yeah, it was a very confusing day for him, I think. <laughs> how we all felt for the past year. Who am I? What is going on? <laughs> so we can relate. Um, I uh, like it. I love this show start to finish. And I know you follow me on Twitter and it scares me sometimes if I ever have like a critique because I know you're doing far better of a job than I could ever do. But my one thing was that the episode two ending had the massive cliffhanger with the timeline bombing. And then the next time we see the TVA, it was resolved. So I think the, the obvious assumption is that the TVA kind of fixed that. But I just wanted to ask for my own personal closure on that. Was that something that was ever plan to be something bigger or did the TVA just go resolve that? And it was like, we don't need to spend time on it because it's not integral to where we're going. Ooh, okay. One thing I'd say is always critique. I think it's kind of fun. I like seeing people's thoughts and feelings on it. Um, oh, I'm just trying to think now. I don't think so. I think it was always that she bombed it and it ended in a big way. What we used to have actually was so in Alyssa's script, there used to be basically that it carried on. So she like went into the TVA and there was, we called it like the rampage. And originally I think in the script that was massive. It was like her going through the TVA and taking everyone out. But I don't know if we ever saw them clean it up though. And necessarily, I think it was always something that happened off screen. I think it was more just like the difference we did was we ended it with him going through the door in episode two, which we found in the edit. Um, and then, but yeah, in terms of that, I think, sorry, I'm just thinking out loud. I think it was always off screen. Now I think about it because it was always, you saw her do her rampage kind of through the TVA and we're with Loki's POV, right? And then they end up on Lamentus. So it's kind of like the TVA have been doing that while they've been on Lamentus, but yeah. But I totally get you guys are like, so, but maybe that's good. Maybe there's like some more to be explored there. <laughs> or I think it's also me just, just trying to like, just like I go out here with all these theories and I'm, I'm almost always wrong, but the theories are the most fun thing. And I dove into that one so head on and I, and I was like, ah, oh. <laughs> I, I overthought that one. <laughs> So um, Owen Wilson really shines through season one and season one has so many Easter eggs to Mobius's comic history and Mark Grunewald. Um, do you know who Mobius is in his normal life pre-TVA and did, did, was that something that was ever considered as something that you would show the audience? So I think for us, like we had spoke about, I think there were a few drafts of the script where you did see like a family or you did see a life, but I think we all kind of decided we don't know what it is yet. And I think that's exciting, right? Because it gives more road to travel with him. And I think it's more painful when he's going to be deleted, him saying, what if I had a family? Because maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I don't know whether writers will take his character. But I think that, yeah, I think the main thing we felt was that I think it was just that kind of in the turning of amping up the tension, it was more effective, I think, with B-15, for example, like her seeing her memories and seeing the impact that had upon her life. And then I think that kind of echoes then across everyone in the TVA because, you know, you see how much it moves her and what she does because of what she sees. So I think for us, it felt like at least in this part of the show that we didn't want to necessarily do flashbacks. But yeah, I think we definitely... The writers and I definitely had spoke about it and explored it with the studio, but I think we all decided just in terms of when everything started to line up, oh, it's actually better to play it out this way and then it can be left open for, you know, future exploration, basically. I love that. So um, episode three resonated with so many people for confirming Loki's sexuality. Personally, as a bisexual woman, it meant the world to me to see that on screen. Um, how did you approach crafting that moment, knowing how significant it would be to so many fans? Yeah, so when I joined, it was very important to me and it was important to the team and everyone. And I think the main thought was really just about finding the right place for it and the right way to acknowledge it. Um, and the train felt appropriate just because it's kind of, you know, it's weird to say, it, but it's almost like a first date, right? Like both these characters are kind of bearing their souls and like getting to know each other and being more honest about themselves. And it just felt like, well, you know, she's trying to work him out and get to know him so it felt like that's the appropriate place to do it really and I think beyond that it was just important that it was just you know like how to explain it it's like a weird way to say almost just kind of said like how someone was you know if someone asked me I would just be very matter of fact about it and I think that was also important as well it's just like not normalizing it I guess would be how I would say it yeah 
And I, I love how you even put the bisexual lighting colors yes. in the back of that too. <laughs> yeah, that was such a great touch. <laughs> Very clever. Very well done. Um, episode three, speaking of, uh, I'm apparently on the cliffhanger train here, uh, but it ends on that amazing cliffhanger with the, but the one shot, the continuous shot, which I loved that. I thought I've hooked that my Disney plus up to a projector just so I could watch it on a bigger wow. screen. And it was beautiful and it was so well done. I would love to hear like, you stitched so many pieces of that together. Like how mm -hmm. long did that take? Was that the most involved shot of the whole show? Yeah, like basically we, so we filmed it during COVID. So we actually had to, we filmed it right near the end of the schedule because obviously like all our amazing actors in that scene who were playing all the people, like they all had to isolate for like a while and just so we could actually pull it off safely. Um, yeah, but it took, I think it took us maybe just under a week to film it all. And I had the best time. It was great. We were outside in this, because like Kazra built a huge set for it. So it felt like you were in Cheru. And I think that's the very first thing me and Autumn, my DP ever worked on because we had Bish's script and I think just the way it was written was just so like you wanted to be with them in the moment. And I think there were other places where I'd sort of been wondering, oh, should this be in a one or should this be in a one? And I think Alyssa, the writer for Ep2 at one point, she'd pitched, oh, maybe Sylvie's Rampage could be a one. -er. But I think I just felt like Sheru made sense to me because you just want to feel like you're along with the characters for the ride in that moment. And yeah, and it took months like planning with everyone, like my DP Autumn, my stunt coordinator Monique, uh, Kazra obviously with like building things that we could then use to stitch or you know transition through my VFX team as well so like yeah I mean there were so many people's efforts but I think it's the first thing I started working on in 2019 so we we were working on it for ages like just to get that right so yeah it's sort, of, sort of like oh we were always chasing it and trying to make that work so yeah I mean Bravo. Like that was, it came out so incredibly. Like congrats to all of you for working together on that. <laughs> Thank so you. <laughs> so um, I saw that you said that the throne Loki scene, like the King Loki scene was cut from the season because it didn't really fit. Were there any more deleted scenes? Cause I know that one was obvious to fans since it showed up in the trailer, but I was curious beyond that. Um, I think beyond that, like nothing major. I think there's always like trimming on scenes and you tighten it, right? Cause I love improv. So, you know, like the actors would improvise um, bits and then you kind of take which bits you want to use. But I think that was kind of the main one. Um, we did a little bit of reshaping to create a lake, which is the lake they go to, because um, that used to be in episode three, but we did a lot of kind of structural reshifting in the edit. So with that going into episode four, we did a little bit of like tweaking basically to that scene. Um, but yeah, I think that was probably the main one um because it it also should say it was not it was basically meant to be like a flashback to him in Asgard and it was like a kind of like a frog of thunder reference but and it was really funny but it's just he was literally I think the next thing that happened is he saw Frigga and it just it felt tonally a bit rot like it was almost taking away from what was to come and like and like so it's not like it didn't work isolated but it's just one of those things you know when you're cutting something together it was like oh no actually like it's really fun seeing him as db cooper but you kind of need a breath now to allow the mother and all the rest of that to have the impact it does otherwise it felt like we were sort of not treating that respectfully basically so yeah so that's kind of how that came to pass that totally makes sense so episode five is so chock full of easter eggs um to mm -hmm. some extent it feels like you can just throw anything in there because since they're from another universe it doesn't have to necessarily affect the main canon um i know you made james gunn's dream come true by throwing in the thanos copter um how did that d detail get in there because i know myself and our boss at comic book and so many other people were so happy to see that now be canonized yeah so i didn't actually know about it and like basically, so Kevin Wright, our creative, he's like our executive producer from Marvel. We were just thinking of stuff and he obviously knows about that. And he was like, oh man, he's like, this is the place to bring in that. And like, I just thought it was the funniest thing I've ever seen. Like, I love that his name's across it. Like, it reminds <laughs> me of like when kids in school have their name on their pencil case or something. I was just like, why is he written his name on it? But yeah, so no, it felt like, of course we have to bring that in here. Cause it's just, it's just too funny. It's just too funny, but yeah. No, we had a lot of fun and Dan Delu as well, our VFX supervisor, who's like basically like Marvel royalty, like he did like Infinity War and Endgame and like, yeah, but he had, he's like 
super nerd and he was like oh this will be cool and this will be cool and this would be cool so it was actually really fun it was just kind of all of us pitching in like crazy stuff basically across the whole episode but yeah but no the copter is very special <laughs> i was very happy with that yeah that, I, I i that was like that leonardo dicaprio moment where you pop out of the recliner and you're like oh, oh, oh. <laughs> there, yeah. was, I, there was also the the yellow jacket helmet and i have to ask because i know yellow jacket was like perma shrunk into maybe the quantum realm we don't really know quantum mm -hmm. mania is coming up like did you have to talk with peyton reed about whether or not you could include that so that was actually a pitch from dan delu our vfx supervisor and no, I mean, it maybe it went to him, but like, like I said, so Kevin Wright, our executive producer, he was like sort of our Marvel gatekeeper. So I, I, he would, you know, that's kind of how they do things. So like basically he would be across all that kind of stuff. And I assume behind the curtain be checking, was everything okay with, you know, Kevin Feige and that it didn't unravel anything for anything else. But no, I think generally they're across Marvel and everyone, it was just fun, right? It was just a lot of goodwill to have fun with it and give a lot of kind of fun Easter eggs. So, I mean, yeah. you had like the living tribunal in there and like, mm -hmm. I mean, like everything, it was great. I, that was a fun episode right. to watch for that alone. <laughs> Well, and going off of that, we finally got Frog Thor. I know that was another moment where I leapt off my couch and was just so happy. Um, what was Chris Hemsworth's reaction when you told him that you were going to voice that, that he was going to voice that character? Yeah, so he was definitely up for it. I think I remember recording it with him because basically we we had that other scene originally that was in episode one. So that's what I had all these recordings for. But I was just like, oh, I feel so bad that we couldn't get it into one because it just wasn't quite right. And but then basically I always had that shot designed where I think I got the idea from Futurama or something, but you know, where you go through like the dirt and like go down into the lair. And I was, I knew, I, I think in my head, I was just like insert Easter egg. <laughs> and I was like, we'll put something cool here. And then I think we'd been through a few things, but it was just as episode one was like locking in the cut. I was just like, oh, well let's put Frog of Thunder there. Cause that's really fun. And you know, we could put the little comic book reference on the jar and like, yeah. So I just thought that was kind of a fun little nod to him there. But no, Chris was like, I think he was into, I remember him laughing, but it was just so surreal <laughs> recording him. Cause even in the original uh, version we had, it was a very short scene anyway. So it was very short and sweet, but yeah, but he found it very funny. I think <laughs> he was just probably like, okay, cool. Well, my, what is this? <laughs> like, yeah. That's awesome. That's fun. For, uh, in the last episode, you were tasked with introducing a variant of Kang or Mortis or the He Who Remains, Jonathan Major's debut in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, who we, we I believe the first report was that he's cat. He was for Ant-Man and the Wasp was where he was cast for. But then you are tasked with introducing him and like this Willy Wonka-esque performance, which was so much fun to watch. I love to hear, like, what was it like? Did you have a hand in casting? Like, did you have a hand in kind of create, like, like crafting that performance? Like, where did that, like, as a director who's putting something as part of this puzzle, how does that all work? Yeah, so basically, um, we always, that he was going to be in the show, and we hoped that that would come to pass is great um but with the casting yeah so it was me the studio and Peyton and we just kind of yeah spoke about who we thought would be cool and Jonathan Majors was someone that we were all massively excited by so yeah I, I was kind of like how am I in this conversation but this is great but just because it's such a massive decision for Kevin Feige and his team but I was very grateful to be you know at the table with them but yeah so basically but I, obviously, as you've mentioned, like I knew that he was going to be a variant in our show, which in some ways alleviates the pressure because I don't know what Jonathan's going to do in the future movies. But I knew for our one, I was like, OK, well, let's just focus on our one, which is he who remains and he's a variant. And I think me and Jonathan, I think really the fun of it, honestly, was finding that fine balance between a character that's there's the introverted sense that he's living alone. Right. And he's only, and I think the only person we sort of allude that he probably talks to is Miss Minutes. Uh, but then the extroverted part is that, yeah, he's, he's interested. I mean, I think Jonathan spoke a lot about, he did a lot of clowning and he said that he drew inspiration from that. And I think for me, honestly, Jonathan is such a good actor. It's really just about sort of giving him the runway to play and have fun with it and then knowing the bits where me and him were like okay let's maybe like bring them in and go quieter here so I think that was the key thing was like where is he who remains being playful and where is he being genuine with them like when he says like wait till you meet my variants I feel like he's being genuine then because you have to believe him then because I think you know he's telling the truth at that point so that was kind of the other thing as well is like when is he lying when is he not lying 
Um, so was He Who Remains supposed to be kind of the version of Immortus? Because based off of the comics, it feels like there's a lot of similarities between the two characters. Yeah, he definitely drew inspiration from him, but it's kind of, I suppose, a bit like Sylvie in our show. It's like a, an original version of the character like for the show but yeah but he definitely drew inspiration from him I mean we even have like a reference in the costume it's very subtle obviously like with the colors on his chest um oh but the costumes the fun one to talk about as well is that Christine my costume designer she kind of pulled inspiration from across multiple eras because obviously he's a character that exists outside of space and time but at the same time obviously I think the pandemic might have affected it because we're all living at home and so it's kind of like loungewear as well <laughs> that he's wearing which is I think, kind, of, kind of fun but yeah, because he's just chilling out in his office. But anyway. <laughs> do, do you get like nervous? Because like the Owen Wilson casting came out when he before it was officially announced. And then like when Jonathan Major steps onto set, that's like an even bigger one. You know what I mean? Because it's mm -hmm. part of like the whole future there too. And Mobius obviously looks like he's going to continue. But Kang the Conqueror is seemingly the big next mm -hmm. villain, big bad. Like do you get like kind of like a like a, a constant fear of like anytime a Kang the Conqueror story pops up like oh did they catch us did they find out it was definitely quite nerve-wracking because I remember that we were filming with Sophia one time and like she had her picture taken and like the pictures got leaked and I was like oh it's such a shame because it's such a and, and obviously that's going to be like a small pool of the fan base right and I get that people are excited and that hopefully the majority of people didn't see those but yeah but I was always like oh I really hope it doesn't get spoiled and somehow by some shred of a miracle <laughs> it didn't and everyone yeah kept the secret and I, I think it's just so cool then because it gives us so much impact it was fun though seeing people pick up on little hints that we'd given early in the show and being like oh could it be him could it be him and I was just like haha because <laughs> I knew we were gonna deliver at least on a version of that so yeah <laughs> that, was really cool. that was really cool Kevin Feige said in a recent interview that there was like a meeting with all of Marvel about how the multiverse is going to work and all the rules there and stuff like that. So, I mean, I, I know that like you've touched on some of like the collaborative efforts and sometimes the producers just kind of keep everybody, you know, fluidly in check with each other. But I am curious because it seems very clear this Loki is going to kind of be the, the, the setup for maybe some of Spider-Man No Way Home and Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness very clearly. Like, did you have to talk, did you ever have conversations with John Watts or Sam Raimi directly to be like, hey, we're doing this, does this help? Like, like did, did those conversations happen with you guys? Not between filmmakers. So basically every filmmaker has a sort of like, um, you work with an executive producer from Marvel. So I was working with a producer called Kevin Wright and he would have those internal conversations and then he would come back and be like, These, this is anything we need to shift, you know, from that bigger multiverse conversation. So it definitely was places that, yeah, in the story we tweaked it, but particularly in how we explain stuff in the Miss Minutes video, um, and then obviously like when he who remains is telling his story and how he did everything. I think that was, we had an idea, but it was sort of always evolving based upon, you know, the ripple effect of the nature of the beast, basically. So now tell us everything you know about Dr. Strange and the Multiverse. <laughs> <laughs> I actually I don't want to know. I want to see that movie's trailer and everything, but also it's like, I want to be surprised. I generally don't know anything. That's the thing that they're really good at is that you sort of, they, you know as much information as you should know. <laughs> so, That's smart. That's yeah. smart. It's yeah. for the best for everybody's safety. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, everything I know is in our show right now. So how that will affect the rest of it, I don't know, but I'm excited to see. But, Once Tom yeah. Holland or Mark Ruffalo find out, it's over. It's over. <laughs> Um, so you've said in the past in previous interviews that you are a huge fan of X-Men, the animated series, and that that's a huge part of how you got interested in Marvel, um, and that you also would love to return to Marvel down the line. Would you be interested in directing an X-Men movie or some sort of project involving those characters? Because I know myself and a bunch of other fans are like, yes, you should be like, you should definitely do this if you wanted to. <laughs> oh man, like, yeah, if the phone rang, I mean, honestly, if Kevin Feige called me about anything else, I, I and even like, I, I just, I must stress because the reason I'm not coming back was just because I loved it and I have so much love for the company and the team. It's honestly just that I'm a writer and I want to just write what I do next. That's all it is. And that I've got some projects that I'm working on. So no, if if Kevin Feige calls me and wants me to, I would happily, happily anything, anything. But yeah, no, and I do love X-Men. Like, oh, I just, I love it. So yeah, so no, I'd be very, I feel very lucky if they want to be back for anything, but... 
yeah. I think we would also consider ourselves lucky to see you back with Marvel. But we're definitely looking yeah. forward to supporting what you got next and, and what's coming fully out of your mind when you're writing as well. And I, to end this, I want to chop up a couple like let's just Easter eggs and stuff with you. But first, I know you're a Lost fan. OK, I'm a huge yeah. Lost fan. You brought in Elias. Like, come on. <laughs> It was that, were you trying to take advantage of this, giving the smoke monster some more work here? I love that. I, I was like, she had to have drawn a little bit from loss with this. It's such a weird one, right? Because I don't, cause like me and Michael, the writer, we both love that show. And like, but Elias is from the comics and obviously we, we adapted it from the comics, but like, it was really funny, but the nature of the beast is it, well, the beast is literally his, his living storm. So I was like, it was weird how it ended up sort of going because we were looking at actual weather and I assume Lost maybe did the same, but all our references, like, yeah, but I remember being in the edit and being like, oh, I was like, this does have an element of that monster. But as you said, it's good to give the monster work, so. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. in, in, I, I think in episode two, it might've been episode one, but there was the line Mobius says, like the nightmare department. And all of us were like, Mephisto. <laughs> Was that, was that like a, like, cause I, I also talked to Black Widow writer, Eric Pearson, and he said sometimes like he put Crimson Dynamo in the script and Ursa, and sometimes those things just get passed and they don't have a deeper meaning. Sometimes they do. When you, <laughs> when you say things like the nightmare department, is that like a, okay, we want to maybe reference nightmare for fun, or maybe we have a deeper meaning here. I think from what I remember, it was, it was meant to be like a fun reference for, you know, yeah, at people like yourself <laughs> to be like, oh, what does it mean? So yeah, that was more what we were going for with that. But but who knows? I mean, like I said, I don't, I only have so much information. So right, right, right. <laughs> it will play for a bigger scheme. <laughs> that makes sense. And in the in the last episode, the way it opened was so cool with the all the lines of dialogue from the Infinity Saga. Like, did you hand pick all of the dialogue there and how it all kind of came? Like, talk to me about making those decisions on what to include. Yeah, so basically that sequence was a really interesting one, like ever evolving. So like, I'll try and talk for it very quickly, but basically, so Eric Martin, the writer was like, oh, I think it'd be fun to do like an homage to contact at the beginning of six. And he'd written in that we kind of move through space and then we go to the end of time and see the Citadel. And basically I took that idea to a storyboard artist called Darren and me and him worked on it. And Darren was pitching the idea of like playing with time within it, hence like also the two black holes, which was so cool. And then I was thinking, oh, it'd be fun to have some little MCU nods in there as well. Like, you know, the ships we see, for example, as we go through. Um, so that was like kind of the visual evolution. And Darren also pitched the idea that what if the timeline is circular rather than a straight line at the end? And I just was like, oh, that completely like blew my mind. Cause I was like, that's great because we've set up that almost like time is a straight line. And in Miss Minutes even says it, I think she's like, oh, we think of time as one straight line, but what is it actually? And I thought that was really fun. Cause it kind of shows like how we used to think the earth was flat and it's not. And like, kind of like the TVA's knowledge was a bit limited. So that was like the visual thing. But the thing we were finding was, was like, visually it was really cool but like we were like oh but this feels like we want something extra and when we went into the physical part of the timeline at the end I was saying to my editor I was like oh well let's like put sounds of the earth in there like the ba a baby crying and like the city and a jungle and like it was really weird and like so she put all these kind of like sounds in there and then we had a few quotes from time um, and basically me Emma Kevin Wright and her assistant Sarah Bennett we were all really excited about that and then basically we showed that to Kevin Feige and the other executives and they were like, oh, wait, that bit at the end is really cool with like all the weird sound. And then Kevin Feige was like, oh, we've never done like voices on the opening before. And then we were like, oh, my God, that's great. So I think for us, we got excited about that in terms of the beginning. And then we were like, oh, well, let's just do it for the whole opening. And then it's like a kind of a handoff to the previous phase and paying homage to that. But then it's also kind of a summary of this chaos of the universe you know what I mean that he who remains is surrounded by so essentially in picking the quotes I would say like I think there was some that you know everyone was pitching in it was a massive group effort I think Marvel were like oh this quote would be cool or this quote would be cool um but my editor and Sarah her assistant they did a lot of the heavy lifting on picking those quotes I think the main rule we went by was obviously whoever's picture it was we wanted their quote by their name um, so that's kind of how that came to pass, really. And then when we extended out to the universe, we were also working with the Disney diversity team um, in terms of just, you know, who 
who are we whose voices were in that so yeah so it was really fun but that's partly why I was working on the show like right up till episode two because we were doing this in crazy soundscape um but yeah but it was like a massive team effort and yeah we were all very proud of it so yeah I'm really glad people enjoyed it <laughs> that's amazing Thank you for joining us. Uh, if you ever want to come play MCU trivia with us, you're welcome to be our celebrity guest against the fans and good luck with your day here. Sweet. Thank you so much. I love to. Cheers. <laughs>